I'm going to show you guys some stuff about the Bible you had no idea was there. The Bible is divided into two major parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, each testament has many different writings by many different authors, and all the authors are listed there. Now, the dates of when these books are written also vary. So the Old Testament was written about 1,500 years before Christ was born, all the way to about 500 years before he was born. So any, anywhere between those two dates, you have all these writings happening. And then Christ came. And then the followers of Jesus Christ wrote about what he said and what, the, what he did, and that's the New Testament. So I'm going to show you something in the Old Testament concerning predictions of the future. Through the prophet Isaiah, in chapter 46, God said this, I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. You see, God claims to know the future. He actually puts his integrity on the line by claiming to know the future and giving us prophecies that we can validate. So what I'm going to show you is that the Jewish feasts, which the Jews were given over 3,000 years ago at Mount Sinai, actually were predictions of the future, which we can confirm are coming to pass. And it's just going uh, to be mind-blowing for you guys. So what I want to show you something about those feasts is this. You can read about all of these feasts in Leviticus chapter 23 in your own time if you'd like. Now, these feasts have two Hebrew words associated with them. Moed, which means an appointed time, as well as Mikra, which means rehearsal. Now, what were the Jews rehearsing for? When you rehearse, you're actually preparing for another event, something similar. It's like when you rehearse for a play. You know, you practice, and then you go do the real thing. So the feasts were actually preparations for something that was going to happen in the future. So I'm going to show you exactly what that is. Now, the feasts are divided into two kinds of feasts. It's either a spring feast or a fall feast or an autumn feast. Now, why is that important? It's important because of this prophecy. Let's learn about the Lord. He will come to us as sure as the morning comes. He will come to us like the autumn rains and the spring rains that water the ground. Now, that is a major clue. You see, God says he's going to come like the spring and autumn rains, just like his feasts are in the spring and the autumn. It's not a coincidence. Now, just as the first feast on the Jewish calendar is the Passover, and it's also the first feast that God established, it's also the first one that we should expect to come to pass. Now, watch this. The first Passover took place in Exodus chapter 12, when God commanded the Israelites to slaughter a lamb per household, so that when the death angel saw the blood of the lamb on their doorposts, it would pass over them. Ever since then, God commanded the Israelites to observe the Passover, to remember this Passover, and to rehearse for another Passover that was to come. Now, about 2,000 years ago, when the Jewish temple in Jerusalem was standing, there was a lot of traditions that were, of course, commanded from Torah, in order to actually observe this yearly Passover. Now, what the high priest would do is this the high priest of the temple of Jerusalem would walk to the nearby town of Bethlehem where he would get a Passover lamb. Then he would carry the lamb on his shoulders through the eastern gate of Jerusalem to the temple where he would then inspect the lamb to make sure it was without blemish. Then on the day of the Passover, between 9 in the morning and 3 in the afternoon, he would slaughter that lamb as well as the lambs of the nation people would bring to him. And then he would have to stand for six hours. Now watch this. Jesus was born in the town of Bethlehem. He was proclaimed the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. In Matthew chapter 21, Jesus walked in through the eastern gate, right as the high priest was bringing in the Lamb of God. Right behind him, Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, walked through the eastern gate. Did you ever wonder why there were all those multitudes waiting around that gate at that time specifically? It's because they were waiting for the high priest to bring the Lamb of God through that gate. And right behind him, in walks Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Over 400 years before Christ came to Jerusalem, the prophet Zechariah made this prophecy. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey. Now watch this. Jesus was then inspected by Pilate and Herod. They found no fault in him. Then on the day of the Passover, 
Jesus was crucified between 9 in the morning and 3 in the afternoon where he stood on the cross for six hours. Isn't that amazing? Now watch this. There was a prophecy made by the prophet Ezekiel hundreds of years before Jesus came. And look what Ezekiel said. Ezekiel 44, Then the man brought me back to the outer gate of the sanctuary, the one facing east, and it was shut. The Lord said to me, This gate is to remain shut. It must not be opened. No one may enter through it. It is to remain shut because the Lord, the God of Israel, has entered through it. Ezekiel was a prophet given a vision of the future, a time when the God of Israel would walk through that gate and then it would be shut. Now it was standing, that gate was standing, and it was open during the time of Ezekiel, and it was open at the time of Jesus. Now, let's look at that gate today. The gate is sealed. About a thousand years ago, Muslims who had taken control of the city of Jerusalem had heard of a prophecy when the God of Israel would walk through that gate. Now, Muslims hate the God of Israel, and they sealed that prophecy. Little did they know that by sealing it, they fulfilled the prophecy. The God of Israel had already walked through that gate. So that means the Passover has already been fulfilled. That also means the other spring feasts must also already be fulfilled. Because remember, the prophecy of Hosea said he's going to come like the spring and the fall. So if he's already come once, because that gate is sealed, which means he had to already come once, well, that also means the other spring feasts must be fulfilled. So the only three left are the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of the First Fruits, and Pentecost. I'm going to show you that Jesus fulfilled all of them coming. Let's look at the first one, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The first occurrence was Exodus chapter 12, verse 14, immediately following the Passover. The Jews were meant to prepare bread without yeast. This is called matzah. I'm sure some of you know what it is. Now, they were to eat this for seven days. Now, during sedars, which are how the Jews today celebrate the Passover and the unleavened bread, what they would do is they'd take the matzah, and they'd take three of them, and they'd put one of them in the middle, so they'd have three pieces of matzah. The middle matzah would be called the afikomen, which they would break and wrap it up and then hide it. Now, there are four cups, and each of the cups represents something. I'll explain that in a second. During the second cup, they go and hide the cracked piece of matzah. And then during the third cup, they go, and, they go and find it and they bring it back. Jews have developed this tradition and they continue to do it to this day, but they don't understand what it means. But we read back in the New Testament in the time of Jesus, this tradition was still going on back then, but Jesus told us what it means. Now think this through with me. We saw with the Passover that before Jesus came, the Passover given to Israel was actually pointing towards their Messiah. So, can we with good confidence assume that the rest of what was given to the Jewish people was pointing towards their Messiah? Well, let's talk about the matzah first. Matzah is like the Messiah, bruised and striped and pierced. And how about the afikomen and the three matzahs? Just as God is a trinity of three persons, the second person, the Son, died, was wrapped and hidden, and was resurrected on the third day. Now, at a Jewish Sedar, which has been celebrated for over 2,000 years, during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, there are four cups. The cup of sanctification, the cup of thanks, the cup of redemption, and the cup of acceptance. Now, Jesus drank of three of these four cups. He drank in Luke 22, and in Luke 22:17, it says, After he took the second cup, he gave thanks. Then he took bread, and he broke it, and said, This is my body, broken for you, the afikomen. 22.20 says, After supper, Jesus took the third cup and said, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, the cup of redemption. Now, he didn't drink the fourth cup, because it says in Mark 14.25, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus didn't drink of the fourth cup, because that would have brought an end to the third cup. But the third cup is now open. We can drink of it with him. He's invited us to drink of it with him. The cup of redemption through the new covenant in his blood shed on the cross. And he says he will finish the covenant when he comes back with his church and he'll drink 
of that fourth cup, bringing an end to it. So no one else can get saved once that cup is drank. So that's why he hasn't drunk of it yet. Two spring feasts left, first fruits and Pentecost. First fruits took place the Sabbath immediately following unleavened bread, where a priest would go a week without touching anyone and offer his first fruits up to God. That's why Jesus, after the resurrection, said, Do not touch me, I have not yet ascended to my Father. And that's why the graves broke open and some were resurrected. The first, acceptable unto God, the first fruits. Fifty days later is Pentecost, and that's why the disciples were waiting in the upper room, expecting the prophecy of Jeremiah 31:31 and Joel, where the pouring out of God's Spirit would take place. Just as the first Pentecost God killed 3,000, at the second, he saved 3,000. Now that is the spring feasts, all done. Next video, we're going to talk about the fall feasts and the second coming of Christ, and I'm going to prove the pre-tribulation rapture. God bless. I hope this video has shocked and amazed you.